Welcome back to the show. Let's begin on line three. Good morning, Craig. You're on the air. Good morning, Patty. How are you? I'm fine this morning, sir. Are you calling from Labrador? Yes, I am. Terrific. What's on your mind? Um, I was just like listening to your preamble about the uh, the PUB's uh, hearing that's coming up, their study, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I'm with you 100 percent on. You know, I don't understand uh, how how Muskrat Falls couldn't be considered as part of this study. Certainly, so far as how it affects the transmission exactly, uh, liability, yes. that much, exactly. of course. Yeah. Yes, I mean it, it obviously, uh, you know, it's going to. It has a lot to do with the uh, with the way power is transmitted in the future if this project goes ahead, mm-hmm. which which it looks like it is right now. Uh, also, I'm calling about in response to last week. You had uh, Jim Learning on your show talking about Labrador uh, becoming separate from from the island. I think there's a growing sentiment uh, in Labrador to that effect. Because people are, are realizing that, you know, under the status quo, we really have very little say on what happens here with the resources, with, you know, with the river, with Muskrat Falls. I mean, a lot of people were opposed to this, and uh, it basically fell on deaf ears. Because we are such a small population as compared to the island, you know, we have very little clout in what happens. And uh, I think people more and more in Labrador are starting to realize that, and uh, and they're starting to, to think about how... We can control our own resources and our own future, uh, much the same way that Nunavut has done. Uh, and, and that would be the issue. And I mean, uh, Mr. Erning was quick to uh, clarify or quantify that his separation sentiment was more, it was self governance. That's right, yes. Of some variety. And I hear it all the time, Craig, and I'm sure there is a growing sentiment leaning towards that concept in Labrador. My question to Mr. Learning, and I will put it out to the entirety of Labrador again this morning, is, is the investment or lack thereof in Labrador more a perpetuation of a myth, or is it the reality? I wonder if someone takes a close look at investment. Let's just give it a number, say 15 years. I don't know what the appropriate number in your mind is, and you can tell me. But if we look at it over 15 years, have we actually betrayed and left Labrador behind, or is that the perception of what has actually happened? I wonder. Oh, um, I think I think we have been left behind. I mean, we've got communities in Labrador today in 2014 that are living in third world conditions. You've got a, a uh, coastal boat service to the north to the north coast that is unreliable at best, and they've gone long periods of time over the last couple of years with no service at all. And I mean, mm-hmm. this I mean they're dependent on this to supply their goods for the whole upcoming year, and you know they have nothing else to fall back on. And and to be in that situation in this day and age, I think is is absolutely crazy. With all of the you know the resources that we have here and the money that's coming out of Labrador, I mean that's not a lot to ask for a reliable boat service to an area that has absolutely no roads, no other connection. Uh, I'll agree with that, and I think if you are sitting in certain remote, uh, more remote parts of Newfoundland, the island of Newfoundland this morning, you're saying, same thing here, Craig, same thing here, which is why, once again, I wonder what is perception versus reality in what has happened with Labrador. We have communities on the island here who say, my God, we are left without for extended amounts of time all the time, year-round, not necessarily just when the ice becomes an issue or whatever the government will tell you as to why the Northern Rangers had its transport hiccuped. So, once again, I wonder where the reality lies. Because sentiment doesn't necessarily need facts to grow or gain momentum. People in Labrador feel left out. They feel like they've been treated like second-class citizens compared to those on the island. That's all that really counts is how they feel, not what the facts are, isn't it? Oh, well, that's true, yes. But, I mean, the facts speak for themselves, too. I mean, uh you know, we've got all the resources there, not all the resources, but I mean, we've got an awful lot of resources here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's a very, very large land. It, it is uh, basically uh, still untouched for the most part. You know, it's still pri- pristine wilderness, which is a, uh, a very uh, rare commodity in the, on the planet today. And I was listening to uh, to the news last week on TV. I was watching a show about uh, the news about uh, California, this huge drought they're having. And there's, uh, they're saying there's a very real possibility now that they can run out of drinking water in as little as 60 days. 
Yeah, yeah I read that stuff too. <sighs> Well, I mean, when you hear something like that, and and you think about the the development that's taking place, like the fracking and mining, and and you know where the tailings are going back into freshwater ponds and that kind of thing, water is is a staple of life. It's a huge commodity, and it's only going to become more valuable as time goes on. And you know that's the kind of thing that we should be exploring. I think is developing that kind of resource, uh, and uh, you know one that does not destroy the land, and in fact uh, preserves. You know, a staple of, of life itself. Hard to argue with that one, Craig. Uh, this is probably the most valuable resource on the face of the earth, including exactly. oil and everything else, any mineral included, is water. There's no question. You cannot live without water. Yeah, the, I agree with you on that 100%. And that's where some people are really starting to concern themselves, Council of Canadians and others, about the status of water, the control, the ownership of the public water system. So there's a lot to that. Once again, sir, I think you're on the you're on a very important track or train of thought here. Anything else you'd like to summarize with this morning? Uh, no, I think that's about it for this morning. I'll probably call back sometime in the near future. But uh, I, I do believe that, uh, you know, people in Labrador are starting to wake up and smell the coffee. And I think... Uh I think that you're going to see, you're going to hear a lot more about uh, Labrador's independence as it become a reality uh, sooner rather than later. Let's leave it with this one, based on that comment alone. Just because the minerals lie in the landmass of Labrador, why does that mean you have any more access to the royalties or taxes created by them than anybody else in the province? Considering the fact that there's lots of regions of the province can con contribute little to nothing to the provincial economy, but get their just return as citizens of the province, why would we owe anyone in Labrador any more of the wealth coming from minerals than we do to anyone else in the province? Nobody is saying that Newfoundland owes Labrador anything. What we're saying is we'd like to take control of our own destiny and of our own resources and, and, uh, and you know, go our own way. We'll, we'll develop the resources as we see fit. We'll, we'll benefit from them rather than see the benefits go to others as they've, as they've always done. Not only to Newfoundland, but to to other entities, you know, to to other parts of the world. Right, and I guess well, the control over who owes who. I guess I guess my overriding point would be if we have a provincial flag, if we have a provincial uh, population. What difference does it make where the wealth comes from if we all need the services provided by government? Whether it, be it doesn't, it doesn't make right. a difference. Okay. Yeah. As long as as long as we're status quo, as long as we are Newfoundland and Labrador, right. I agree with you. But what I'm saying is, we want to become a separate territory, take control of our own destiny, like like Nunavut has done, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know what resources are in Labrador then? Belong to Labrador. Yeah, and of course it's not just as simple as, and I know you know this, sir, it's not as simple as, well, we'll be self-governing and all it includes is uh, having some control of your own resources. There's a lot more to self-governance than just determining I know who that. gets a mining license and whether or not there's a smelter demand and that kind of stuff. I know, and I, know I know you know that. That makes it a lot trickier. That's where some of the growing sentiment of self-governance maybe hasn't considered all of the, the darker side of having to be in control of your own destiny. destiny yes, with and, and, in, and in years past, Patty, uh, territories as a rule did not have very much jurisdiction over that sort of That's thing. That's right. You know? Yeah. But but that is changing, and now they're becoming a, a lot more on par with the, with the provinces of the country. Enjoy the conversation, Craig. Hopefully, you stay in touch. Uh, yeah, it's good talking to you. Thanks very much. Have a good day. You too, sir. Bye bye. Bye.